When we were studying Buddhism, we spent a fair amount of time on the life of the Buddha, because the Buddha's story and later additions to that story feature so prominently in Buddhist art. Muhammad is just as important to Islam, but his life story appears much less frequently in art, and there's a simple but important reason for this. Islam forbids the depiction of zoomorphic images, that is, images of humans and animals, or at least they forbid it in religious art. So for the most part, Muhammad is not depicted in Islamic art. On the right, you see a way he is shown. It's a hilye, or description of Muhammad. The work contains exquisite calligraphy, or ornamental writing, and it usually is this verse of the Quran. And we, that is God, did not send you, that is Muhammad, except to be a mercy to the universe. On the left is an unusual Ottoman Turk painting of Muhammad himself. But notice, his face is blank, and even his hands are covered by his sleeves. Nevertheless, the life story of Muhammad, the practices that Muhammad established, even as we'll see the structure of his house in Medina, are vitally important to Islam and to understanding Islamic art and architecture. So let's begin with a video introduction to the life of Muhammad. We're going to continue with Muhammad's story, but first I want to switch videos and look at some ways in which Muhammad's home in Medina helped shape the future plan of the mosque. So now we're going to resume our history of the life of Muhammad and the founding of Islam. Note that from the very beginning, Islam was associated with war and conquest, and that the political and religious rule were combined. Pay special attention to the central role played by the Kaaba, the holy house in Mecca, that is the epicenter of the Hajj. The Kaaba is one of your required works, and one with a mysterious past, and for non-Muslims, a not altogether knowable present. Only Muslims are allowed in the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. So this is a 13th century Persian painting of Muhammad's great victory over Mecca. As we'll see, the Persians were much less reluctant to paint human and animal images. And of course, this is a history and not a religious text. Well, our old hard history textbook didn't even contain this work, although I always taught it. You've heard me complain enough about the college board, so let me just say that here's a case where I completely agree with adding the Kaaba to the required works list. It is one of the most important religious structures in the world, even if it is more uh, theologically and culturally interesting than it is perhaps artistically interesting. The Kaaba is the central shrine of Islam, a place that all pious Muslims are called upon to visit once in their lifetime. I'll talk more about the Kaaba in a minute, but to really understand its role in Islam, we need to backtrack and look at it in context of the five pillars of Islam, and that's where we're going to turn now. So you've already seen the first of the three required images of the Kaaba. Here's the second, and here's the third. So now that you've seen these three images, what do you think it's most important that you remember about the Kaaba? I would say function. The ritual and performance associated with this work is really emphasized, and I think appropriately, in these images. Context is likely key. So in this required image, you see throngs of Muslims circumnabulating the Kaaba. Remember the circumnabulation from the great stupa and also the stupa at Borbadur? But Muslims, as the video explains, walk in a counterclockwise circle. So Buddhists walk uh, in the direction of the sun, and the and the... Muslims deliberately choose to do it otherwise, to indicate that this is not nature worship, that Allah is beyond time and place. So the Kaaba originally contained 360 idols that probably represented the days of the year. But by Muhammad's day, the Kaaba was already being venerated as the shrine of Allah, the high god, the god above other gods. Once a year, tribes from all around the Arabian Peninsula, and interestingly, Christian and pagan tribes, would converge on Mecca to perform the haji, making the widespread, marking the widespread conviction that Allah was the same deity worshipped by all monotheists. Muhammad both built on and, frankly, transformed this tradition. After Muhammad's victory, his tribe rebuilt the Kaaba with alternating courses of stone and wood. The inner space was divided into two rooms, one of which housed the black stone. 
The exterior was covered with habrat cloth from Yemen, and that, by the way, is replaced, I believe, every year. So inside the Kaaba, in its easternmost corner, is the black stone. This stone was venerated in pre-Islamic time and is now the focal point of the Kaaba. The Quran states that God instructed Abraham, together with his son Ishmael, to raise the foundations of the holy house on this site. After Abraham had built the Kaaba, an angel brought him the black stone, a celestial stone that, according to tradition, had fallen from heaven onto a nearby hill. The black stone is believed by Muslims to be the only remnant of the original structure made by Abraham. Abraham then received a revelation in which Allah told him to go and proclaim the pilgrimage to the Kaaba to mankind. And this is the origin of the Hajj, one of the five pillars of Islam, as we just saw. Now, according to Islamic tradition, the black stone was set intact into the Kaaba's wall by Muhammad in the year 605 CE. That's five years before his first revelation. Since then, it has been broken into a number of fragments and is now cemented into a silver frame in the side of the Kaaba. You see that here. Now, my next lecture is going to focus on mosques, but now that we have learned about uh, Muhammad's house in Medina and reviewed the five pillars of Islam, I want to stop and make the very important point that to understand the mosque, and I mean by that any mosque, you need to see it as a building dedicated to these basic elements of the Muslim faith. So the mosque is a place of testimony. The word is proclaimed at the minbar or stepped pulpit. Worshippers are called to prayer from the minaret tower. Prayer is conducted in the prayer hall, in this case represented by an area below a central dome, but in older mosques, usually it was a hypostyle hall with pillars. The mirab shows the way to Mecca and the direction in which to pray. The wall in which the mirab is placed is the Qibla wall. Ritual cleansing and community take place in the courtyard. By the way, one thing that's missing from this is the maksura, which was the special enclosure for political leaders and highlights the fact that separation of mosque and state is not a feature of Islam. So there are four mosques among your required works, and we're going to look at four distinct mosque plans. But for now, we're going to move on to the remarkable spread of Islam as the first group of caliphs transferred the Muslim capital to Damascus in what today is Syria, or I should say the caliphs after the first four caliphs. So Islam spread with extraordinary speed. Muhammad's armies had conquered Arabia by his death in 632. The areas in light blue were conquered under the first four caliphs, and the Umayyad caliphs from their new capital in Damascus went on to conquer the areas in green in less than a 100 more years. So let's pick up the story with the spread of Islam and the establishment of a new Umayyad capital of Damascus. I'm skipping over a lot of very complicated religious history because this is the period when different groups of Muslims uh, were fighting for the leadership of the new religion. Sorry, we just don't have time to go there. So the Mosque of Damascus is not a required work, but I want you to see it anyway because it is the first major mosque and it would set the pattern for most early mosques. So here's the mosque plan. Note that while the prayer hall has hypostyle columns, this is not a dense forest of columns like we see where? Temple of Karnak. There is considerable open space for worshipers. Well, I'm sorry that the otherwise excellent Islamic art video that we've been watching does not discuss the Dome of the Rock. You're stuck with me. The Dome of the Rock is located on a rocky outcrop known as Mount Moriah where, according to Jewish and Muslim belief, Abraham offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice. The inscriptions inside the building glorify Islam as the final true revelation and as the culmination of the face of Judaism and Christianity. The building is actually not a mosque, but rather a shrine erected over a sacred site. There is a very important mosque nearby that's part of the same complex. The Dome of the Rock is located at the visual center of a platform known as Temple Mount. It was constructed on the site of the second Jewish temple, which was destroyed during the Roman siege of Jerusalem in 70 C. Remember how that's uh, depicted on the Arch of Titus and its friezes? Uh, Muslims also, excuse me, it was originally the site of a Christian church. Muslims also believe that this is the place where Muhammad ascended to heaven, accompanied by the angel Gabriel. I've said that the Dome of the Rock is a shrine, not a mosque. Really, it is a shrine to the military 
and spiritual triumph of Islam over Byzantine Christianity, which we're going to be getting to, but not for a couple of units. So the design of this shrine was greatly influenced by the Christian churches constructed during the Byzantine era and constructed in Jerusalem, among other places. Like many Byzantine churches, the Dome of the Rock is octagonal in shape. It also represented the first time a dome was constructed on top of an Islamic religious building. There will be lots more domes to come. The dome was pretty clearly designed to compete with, really to overshadow, uh, the nearby Byzantine Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which was a very important Christian site. So, for all its religious significance, in some ways, this is a victory monument. What other victory monuments have we looked at in this course? Well, there's the Arch of Titus, there's Trajan's Column, the Romans were big on these. This aerial view makes it easier to see that the Dome of the Rock has an octagonal construction. Well, I thought the reading did a good job of explaining the design of this monument, but it didn't really delve into its complicated and, frankly, very troubled history. The Dome of the Rock is located on the Temple Mount, which is a site holy to Jews, Christians, and Muslims. In the foreground here, you see the Wailing Wall, the last remnant of the destroyed Jewish temple. This video gives you some sense of the conflict that has risen over the structure, and it gives you some more views. So these photos of the Dome of the Rock exterior capture really what's my favorite element in many ways of Islamic art, which is the spectacular tile. Green is the traditional color associated with Islam. As you've learned, it has strong association with paradise. But blue in Middle Eastern tradition is the color of protection. And frankly, I think vivid blues are even more characteristic of much Islamic architecture than green. Note, too, the great importance associated with the words of the Quran. Calligraphy, remember that means decorative writing, is one of the most characteristic features of Islamic art. The words portrayed on the tile are usually from the Quran, but sometimes they come from other sacred texts. And again, since the Quran forbids images, Islamic artists channeled their creativity into spectacular interlocking geometric and floral designs. I love these tiles. So that's why I'm showing you still more. Here's another image of the tile work on the Dome of the Rock. Note again the strip of calligraphy. And here you see some of the splendid interior mosaics. These mosaics were created by Christian artists from Byzantium. One of the very interesting things about Islamic art uh, is how much interaction there was between uh, Christian Jews and Muslims and how much of an artistic exchange took place. So these mosaics, again, were created by Christian artists, but when we get to Byzantine art, you'll see that the absence of human and animal fixtures represents an important departure from the Byzantine mosaic tradition. So stay tuned. So you'll recognize the domed octagon when we study the Byzantine Church of San Vitale in Ravenna, Italy. The Muslims borrowed, as I said, very freely from Byzantine Christian art, just as the Byzantine Christians borrowed freely from Rome. The dome was especially important for mosques or other holy places. Why? Well, it provides a large open space for communal prayer, and also it creates soaring outlines that turn thoughts of believers toward heaven. Okay, we have covered a lot of material, especially with the videos, and I hope I've given you a sense of Islam and its rich artistic tradition. In my next lecture, I'm going to explore the four great mosques that feature on the College Board's list of required images.